I'm very happy and uh, delighted to be <clears throat> part of this wonderful conference. Vito and I were particularly excited to see so many young people participating in <clears throat> this conference, which is devoted to Baha'i scholarship. I would like to thank uh, Association for Baha'i Studies for making this possible for all of us to get together and honor Mr. Baluzi. The topic of my discussion today, tonight, is uh, birth of the human being. What I'm going to do in uh, the time which is given to me is first make an introduction discussing what I mean by the birth of the human being and the opposite concept, which is dehumanization of humans. After that, I would trace the emergence of this concept, first in the writings of the Bab, then in the writings of Baha'u'llah, and finally in the writings of Abdul Baha. By the birth of the human being, I mean the emergence of a form of consciousness, a form of culture, a form of social institutions, which would define human beings as human beings and would not reduce human beings to the level of nature, would not reduce human beings to the level of objects, would not define human beings as animals. <clears throat> One of the first expressions of this concept can be found in the most ancient symbols of the Egyptian culture. That's the symbol of a sphinx. This uh, enigmatic and mysterious uh, symbol has been interpreted in varieties of ways throughout history. But from a dialectical point of view, sphinx namely an entity whose body is animal, but whose face is human, represents the purpose and meaning of human history. Namely, human history is a process in which human being would emerge from the background of nature and would emerge as consciousness. Reason and consciousness, spirit, would emerge from the realm of nature. So emergence of human being out of the realm of nature, as consciousness, as love, as a spiritual qualities. This is the purpose and the meaning of human history. Therefore, history becomes a process of emancipation from the bondage of nature. Another example of expression of this same concept is the new definition that Baha'u'llah gave of human being. I'm going to read for you the statement of Baha'u'llah, although we won't have time to really go into detail in discussing that, but at first Baha'u'llah gives a new definition of human being, and then he elaborates on that concept uh, in uh, different ways. Baha'u'llah says, that one indeed is a man who today dedicates himself to the service of the entire human race. It is not for him to pride himself who loves his own country, but rather for him who loves the whole world. The earth is but one country and mankind its citizens. In this statement of Baha'u'llah, first Baha'u'llah defined what is to be a human being. That one indeed is a man who today dedicates himself to the service of the entire human race. Human being is defined in terms of service, but not service to the community, not just belongingness to a society or community, but service to the entire human race. Somehow the category of universality, a universal orientation, a universal sentiment, a universal consciousness, a universal form of identity, for Baha'u'llah is the defining feature of a human being. The emergence of human being from the realm of nature, emergence of that face representing consciousness out of the realm of body, now for Baha'u'llah is defined in more concrete fashions as the emergence of this particular type of 
characteristics and qualities. What does it mean to have a human face? Unfortunately, human history has been primarily a history of dehumanization. Namely, humanity has understood itself and has defined others usually and predominantly as animals, as objects of nature, as instruments. If you look at varieties of forms of oppression in the history of humanity, you can see that the common factor in all these various types of injustice and oppression is the reduction of human beings to the level of nature. Take concept of patriarchy. What is patriarchy? If you analyze the concept of patriarchy, ultimately it's a philosophical point of view which defines the worth, the value of a human being in terms of its biology. The idea that a human body is masculine or feminine, a particular form of biology, is supposed to define, to determine the value of a person, the rationality of the person, the social position of a person. The identity of human being is reduced to the level of body. In this type of culture and in this type of consciousness, the half of the humanity is reduced to the realm of nature, and the other half is also dehumanizing itself by def defining its own superiority in terms of biological characteristics. It's a dehumanization on both sides. What is racism ultimately? Racism al is ultimately a form of consciousness in which it reduces the identity of a person, the worth of the person, the value of a person, the social rights of a person, the opportunities of a person in terms of the color of his skin. What is a slavery? Slavery is ultimately objectification of human being. When a human being is perceived as an object to be owned, so that what happens to a human being is not defined by the consciousness of that person, by the will of that person, rather by the will and consciousness of another, what you have is, again, reduction of human being to the level of objects, to the realm of nature, or dehumanization of human beings. What is a caste system? Caste system, ultimately, is a form of consciousness and social relations which reduces the entire reality of a person to the natural accident of birth. If you are born in this particular family, then everything about you, your rights, your occupation, the way society would treat you, whether you would be touch, touchable or in, untouchable and so on, all of them are going to be determined by this biological accident, totally meaningless accident. But not only in caste society we have this, also, almost in all other forms of social orders, when we have extremes of social inequality, when we have a situation that the prospect of life of children is going to be predominantly determined by the social positions of the parents, again, you have a situation that the society looks at human beings and then assigns them to different roles or positions or opportunities simply on the basis of the identity of the parents. It has nothing to do with this person. In this case, again, human beings are reduced to a natural accident, a biological phenomenon. In this case, who is your father? But this reduction of human beings to the level of nature has many, many other forms. I just talked about a few of them which are more famous. But one very important form of that is the law of apostasy. Apostasy is a religious doctrine. It has been practiced at some time in Judaism. It has been practiced at some time in Christianity. Unfortunately, it is being practiced right now in some Islamic societies. The basic idea of doctrine of, of apostasy or ertedad is that religion is a biological phenomenon. If you're born in a particular family, that that family belongs to this religion, your religion must be that religion. Religion is not a matter of consciousness. It's not a matter of choice. It's not a matter of a spirit. 
It's a matter of blood and body. Not only that, apostasy means that if you're born in a family which has a particular religion, then you grow up and you think for yourself and you decide through your rational deliberations and exercise of reason that you want to change your religion, not to believe in religion or believe in another religion. The law of apostasy argues that this means that you have to be put to death. Apostasy, in my judgment, is the ultimate form of dehumanization. Namely, what is distinctively human, namely the exercise of reason, consciousness, freedom of conscience, that is defined as the ultimate crime. What is happening in Iran right now, in terms of criminalization of the pursuit of knowledge by the Baha'is, is another form of that same doctrine. Consciousness, reason, spirit, to be a human becomes the ultimate crime. To be an animal, to be an object, to be devoid of choice and consciousness and freedom is defined as being religious, as being spiritual, as being divine. Another important major form of dehumanization of humans is nationalism. I'm talking about nationalism because nationalism is the dominant form of definition of identity in the last two centuries. To a large extent, it has replaced the traditional conception of religion as the basis of, of identity. But it's not just nationalism, but also all kinds of tribalism. When you define your identity and your rights on the basis of the accident of the birth in this particular place, in this particular tribe, in this particular country, then that means that the society is again reducing humans to the level of natural accidents. My work is in sociology, and sociologists are preoccupied with the question of social inequality and what is the basis of social inequality. Sociology, however, because of its legacy, 19th century legacy, unfortunately equates society with nation state. And for that reason, when it talks about inequality, it looks at characteristics of inequality within the nation state. Therefore, for sociology, issues like class, race, ethnicity, gender are very important as explaining the dynamics of inequality and oppression in the world. What sociology usually has been completely silent about it is what has become increasingly the most important determinant of social inequality in the world. That basis of social inequality and oppression in the world is increasingly citizenship. The idea that by a, a purely meaningless accident, a child is born in sub-Saharan Africa means that because of this, this child has to be excluded from varieties of forms of rights and entitlements. Citizenship has become a process that on the one hand is a progressive concept defining individuals not as subjects but as people endowed with rights. But citizenship, because of nationalistic institutions of the world, also has become the most important basis of exclusion of rights and entitlements. If a child is born in a rich, in a rich part of the world, that meaningless accident, which has no moral significance at all, predetermines you to varieties of rights and possibilities and prospects in your life. If a child is born in another part of the world, which happens to be poor, again, because of a totally meaningless accident, the entire life of this person is going to be determined. Again, nationalism, in the way that we have, as well as varieties of pre-nationalistic forms of consciousness, consciousness of belonging to a community and tradition in a particularistic fashion, all of them are reductions of the human beings to the, the level of nature. Right now, the most important predictor of social inequality, prospect of life of an individual on this planet, is citizenship. It's not class, it's not ethnicity, it's not gender. All of them are important, but all of them in the context of the concept of citizenship. Baha'u'llah, in the middle of 19th century, recognized this. And it was because of that that he said the 
The earth is but one country and mankind its citizens. The concept that Baha'u'llah introduced is the most revolutionary theoretical, social, political, economic concept that you can imagine. But neither the Baha'is nor non-Baha'is have understood really the implications of this, uh, of this new worldview, this, this, uh, this idea. When he says that the honor, glory, pride is not for one who loves his own country, but for one who loves the entire human race, he's telling us that we have to begin to enter the realm of spirit, to transcend the realm of nature. Morality, sense of honor, as sociologist Emil Durkheim has said, the boundaries of morality is defined by the boundaries of society. The social boundary defines the boundary of morality. If you belong to this particular society, then you consider these people as equal to you to some extent. You, sense, you have the sense of belonging to them. Outsiders are strangers, objects, instruments, enemies. Violence against outsiders is very, very easy and easily justifiable. The boundaries of morality is the boundaries of society. But society, what Durkheim called society, and what Bergson calls closed society, in reality is a naturalistic conception of feeling. Namely, when morality is defined in terms of a sense of community, which is based upon visible, concrete forms of interactions, kinship relations, uh, doing things in common with each other in visible fashions, a tribalistic form of identity. In that sense, people have a sense of solidarity and there is a morality. But this morality is rooted and is an expression of natural feelings. But this kind of feeling, although every kind of love is praiseworthy, if it is particularistic, then it can become easily the cause of hatred and violence. Wars do not happen because people are just hateful. Wars happen because people have a lot of solidarity, a lot of self-sacrifice, a lot of love, but particularistic love. You are willing to self-sacrifice, sacrifice your own life, for your country, for your tribe, for your race, for your religion. This is not an evil thing, this is love. Problem is that this love is not universalistic. And the result of that, of course, is violence. To get rid of violence, to get rid of colonialism, to get rid of imperialism, it's, it is necessary not only to love one's own country, but to love also the entire human race. Love of one's country, if it is not accompanied by the love of the human race, then it means objectification, instrumentalization of the others. Then colonialism is a logical necessity. When Baha'u'llah argued that you have to love the entire human race and not just your own country, he is categorically rejecting the basis of the doctrine and practice of colonialism in the world. In Iran, the enemies of the Baha'i faith always criticize the Baha'is for this statement. They say that you do not love your country. And at the same time, define themselves as people who are opposing colonialism. But they don't understand, they never understood that that type of worldview that they talk about is a worldview of colonialism. You don't want to be colonized by the others, but you have no objections against colonialism. You like to colonize others. You want to be imperialist. You are not against imperialism, but you are against being inferior in the relations of colonialism and imperialism. It was Baha'u'llah who argued that all kinds of particularistic love should be expanded to become universalistic love. One must love one's own country. But loving one's own country should be accompanied by loving the entire human race, 
In that way, then colonialism becomes impossible. You cannot define the others as simply instruments or objects for realization of the particularistic interests of this group of people. This means that we are in the realm of a new morality. It's not a naturalistic morality. It's not a morality which I love this person, I sacrifice myself for this person because of natural feelings that I have out of kinship or other interactions which are visible and material. You have to now love the entire human race. That concept now is, a, is not a visible concept. It's not something that you are in interaction every day with the entire human reality. That concept is a spiritual concept. You have to enter the realm of a spirit. You have, to realm, you have to enter the realm of universality. And in that realm, then, a new concept of morality, a new concept of identity can emerge. Baha'u'llah's statements, definition of human, of human being is a call for hovering above water for entering the realm of spirit. This idea, the birth of the human being, is the truth of all religions. In the beginning of Torah, God says that he wanted to create human being in his own image. If the humanity has understood the meaning of this concept, then we would not have had really any major problem in the world. The problem is that the followers of Judaism, of Christianity, of Islam, which all of them accept this statement, they usually did not understand this statement. To say that human being is made in the image of God means that the truth of the human being has nothing to do with the body of human being. Because God ha does not have body. God is not a material entity. So the skin of color, whether a person is male or female, which place you are born, all these things become totally accidental and arbitrary and irrelevant to definition of the truth and identity of a human being. Once we understand that human beings are made in the image of God, we identify the truth of human beings as a spirit, as consciousness, as love, as a spiritual powers, not as characteristics, accidental, meaningless characteristics of the body of nature. A social order which understands that God made human beings in his own image cannot accept slavery, cannot accept racism, cannot accept discrimination of people on the basis of varieties of uh, issues, including creed. It cannot have a, a world in which the destinies of the people would be determined by the meaningless accident of the birth in this tribe or in this nation. The world has not understood that profound spiritual insight which is in the beginning of Torah. Jesus also invited us, called us, to become born for a second time, but this time to be born from the realm of nature. So the message of Baha'u'llah is an eternal spiritual message, but we are living in an exciting age an age in which human beings can concretely, not in void the slogans, emerge out of the realm of nature and enter the realm of spirit. That means that to be a spiritual ultimately is defined in terms of this universalistic orientation. And this is very, very important. Abdul Baha has given us a new definition of spiritual. Frequently, Abdul Baha has said, Har amr umumi elahis. Whatever is universal is divine. He repeats this many, many times. In his speeches in the West, he has said these things in his varieties of tablets. Whatever which is universal is divine. God's love, God's creation is universal because it is divine. Sun is made by God is a divine bounty. For that reason, it shines upon everybody. It doesn't make discrimination between rich and the poor, black and white, male or female. 
reign is universalistic and Baha'u'llah called the leaders of the world to follow the politics of God. In English, usually this is translated as policy of God, but the original word is the same thing. Policy and politics are one and the same. You have to follow siyasatullah, siyasat ilahi, the politics of God. God's politics is universalistic. Human politics also must be universalistic. In that case, it becomes divine. It, in that sense, it becomes a spiritual. This means that many people might not know that they are spiritual, but they would, they would be in reality deeply spiritual. If you care about human rights, if you care about peace, if you care about humanity and love humanity and act and feel in those ways, you are a spiritual from a Baha'i point of view. Even if you do not engage in prayer, even if you assume that there is no God, from a Baha'i point of view, this person is much, much more spiritual than a person than, than a person that day and night is engaged in praise of God and worship, but whose life is dedicated to discrimination and suppression and violence and hatred and enmity against others. So the birth of the human being requires a new culture, a culture in which East and the West come together. But this means that both the East and the West must be reconstructed. It's not just East and the West superficially come together. Both has to be redefined. Both have to be reconstructed. That is why we have to go beyond both religious traditionalism of the East and Western materialistic modernity. And the link which binds them together, of course, is rejection of dehumanization of humans, rejection of particularism, rejection of reduction of human beings to the realm of nature. In the world in which we live, people identify these two ideologies as opposites of each other. Each one justifies itself in terms of rejection of the other. The religious fundamentalist justifies itself in terms of pointing to the negative aspects of the Western modernity. It talks about colonialism, for instance, history of colonialism by Western modernity. From that, it concludes that, therefore, its own fundamentalistic Eastern tradition, traditionalistic conception of religion is the truth. The Western materialistic modernity points to the abhorring forms of violence and dehumanization, which is prevalent in these forms of fundamentalistic uh, forms of social order. And from that, it concludes that the only form of moral order is a rational moral order, is an order which is based upon reason, and that becomes a materialistic modernity. What is missing in both conceptions is that actually these two points of views have much in common. They appear to be opposite of each other, but in fact, the ultimate principle is one and the same. And that principle is dehumanization of humans, reduction of humans to the level of nature. In the case of materialistic modernity, when you have a worldview in which ultimately pure capitalism, namely extreme forms of social inequality, and nationalism and militarism become the logical expressions of modernity, you have the ultimate dehumanization of humans. You are defining society as a jungle. And the law of struggle for existence becomes the regulating principle of this order. That is the ultimate reduction of humans to the level of nature. But in the case of religious, traditionalist, they think that they are opposed to materialism. But when you have a situation that to be religious, to be a spiritual, means to justify varieties of forms of hatred, of alienation, of estrangement, of defending patriarchy, of opposing freedom of conscience, of justifying varieties of forms of violence and war, when God comes on the part of a state 
and suppression and war by one state against others is defined as the will of God. When apostasy is defined as a spiritual, ultimate de-spiritualization of humans is defined as religious, as a spiritual, we have a situation that in the name of religion, the entire worldview becomes the worldview of reduction of human beings to the realm of nature. The function of religion is to help us to transcend the selfishness of our base natural impulses, to help us to understand the interconnections of all reality, to help us to, to move towards love and unity. That is the meaning of God. That is the meaning of becoming a spiritual. But unfortunately, in human history, in religious history, often the concept of religion has become the most vicious tool in order to justify, to further those base impulses, the violent impulses of human beings. Therefore, emergence of the human being as human being requires a reconstruction of what we have called religion so far and what we call rationality and modernity uh, in terms of the modern West. I wanted to trace the emergence of this concept in the writings of the Bab and Baha'u'llah and Abdul Baha. I, I try to be very brief on each one of them, although uh, <clears throat> the entire Baha'i point of view, in my judgment, is really ultimately the same concept. In the writings of the Bab, I mentioned three uh, separate things which are symbols of this. I'm just selecting three issues. There are so many. One is declaration of the Bab. In terms of religious history, normally the beginning of a spiritual movement, the beginning of religion, is defined as the point that the prophet attains prophetic consciousness. It is defined as the moment that there is a dialogue, beginning of a dialogue between the prophet and God. The prophet becomes conscious that he has a mission and he's a prophet of God and then you have the beginning of a new religion, a new religious culture. In the inception of the Baha'i spiritual movement, this is not the case. Declaration of the Bab is the moment in which the Baha'i faith is born. This new spiritual movement is created but that moment is not the moment that the Bob becomes conscious of his prophetic consciousness. Bob, in varieties of his writings, gives us exact dates of when these events happen, and they are not at the time that uh, declaration of the Bob takes place. It's much before that. But those events are not the beginning of the Baha'i faith, are not the beginning of the mission of, of the Bob. They are not the beginning of the day of resurrection, as the Bob calls it. When is the beginning of the mission of the Bab, of the Baha'i faith, of the history of the Baha'i faith? It is when there is a dialogue between a human being, in this case, the first believer of the Bab, Mullah Hussein and the Bab. It's a dialogue between God and humanity. This is crucial. In this idea, human being becomes the image of God. Human being participate in creation of religion. The word of God which defines the revelation is already presupposes this dialogue with humanity. That's why in the Baha'i faith, religion is not a static. It doesn't become an arbitrary will of God for eternity. It is on the contrary, an interaction between divine will and the advancement, aptitude, interest, development of human consciousness. That interaction defines what would be the content of the revelation, what would be this divine word. Even divine word is not just one-sided uh, entity. It's ultimately a dialogue. This is the first moment that you have the identity of the Baha'i faith and the identity of the new civilization, which is a dialogical civilization. It's a dialogical culture, not just democracy, but a democracy which is associated 
with feelings of unity, with love, with respect. In the Baha'i faith, we call that consultation. It's not only in the declaration of the Bab, but also in the martyrdom of the Bab. You see the, the same creative impulse. The martyrdom of the prophet, of the sacred figure, is always a cosmic drama defining the theological structure of the religion. In Christianity in particular, the central theological event, of course, is martyrdom of Jesus. But in this martyrdom, usually it is the prophet, the sacred figure, who is sacrificed. The Bab, however, changes this. The night before his martyrdom, he chooses to be martyred together with one of his believers. And he asks this question, he says, I know that tomorrow I'm going to be martyred, but I prefer that one of you kill me. And who among you would be willing to do that? And of course, his disciples are all frightened and abhorred doing that, except one of them. Now, that one already has been martyred because he has annihilated his will in the will of the Bab. In his will, nothing could be seen except the will of the Bab. He was already martyred, but the physical martyrdom takes place tomorrow. That's an accidental realization of that. The moment of the martyrdom of the Bab, as Baha'u'llah testifies, is the moment that the blood and the flesh of the Bab and his disciple have become indiscriminately united. You could not see in the flesh of the disciple anything but the flesh of the Bab. That's a symbolic expression of the fact that in this martyrdom, we don't have now martyrdom does not mean silence or death. It means emergence of that universal spiritual truth in new forms, in the form of a new culture, in the form of a new human race that he wants to create. The Bob doesn't die, and his martyrdom is not silence. That's why in the language that the Bob uses, the word martyrdom means simultaneously witnessing, seeing the truth, namely the connection of all reality, this, that this material aspect is just an illusion, and we are all interconnected, and witnessing in the sense of loudly proclaiming the truth. Another expression of this concept in the writings of the Bab is the centrality of word. In the writings of the Bab. Previously, in the form of ordinary consciousness of the believers, the sign of the presence of God, sovereignty of God was strange natural events. We call them miracles. Strange natural events, which would defy the realm of reason and science, is seen as the sign and evidence of the presence of God. The Bab changes this. The Bab argues that the supreme evidence of the presence of God is something which is close to God, which is expression of the truth of the humanity, and that is consciousness. Therefore, the word, not a strange natural event, something spiritual, something belonging to the realm of spirit, that becomes the sign and evidence of the presence of God. The third item that I want to mention very briefly is reinterpretation of the concept of resurrection in the writings of the Bible. Concept of resurrection in traditional conceptions of religiosity usually means the end of history. The Bab changes this because to be a human being, as we would see, means to be historical and to be dynamic. The concept of resurrection becomes a doctrine of affirming historicity and change and dynamism, not the end of history, but the emergence of a new stage of human development. But in addition to that, and in addition to many other points that we are not going to discuss, in the normal religious consciousness, usually the concept of heaven as the ultimate reward, as the ultimate spiritual destiny of human spiritual journey is defined as a situation and a place characterized 
by unlimited sex without love and unceasing insatiable consumption without work and creativity. <laughs> this is the conception that people normally have of heaven. The purpose of human history, coming of religions, divine words, and so on, is that ultimately people end up in this situation. But if you pay attention, this is exactly the way an animal is. All the cows, all the animals live exactly in this way. So the concept of heaven becomes ultimate dehumanization of humans. The reduction of human beings to the realm of nature, to become perfectly an animal. That is defined the ultimate meaning and purpose of human history. The Bob changes all these things. And of course, spiritualization of the world. That becomes the defining feature of the day of resurrection. <clears throat> resurrection is defined by recognition of the spiritual truth. And of course, the Bob links this to the idea that heaven is not just for human beings. This is another innovation of the Bob. Everything has a heaven and hell. But the heaven of everything is realization, attainment of its potentialities. The hell of anything is its deprivation from realization of that, uh, realization of uh, potentialities of that thing. Therefore, the Bob says that human being has this responsibility that for everything, for the entire realm of nature, to make sure within its realm of capacity that things would acquire, reach their heaven. You want a theory of environmental protection, the most important, the most sublime expression of that are the writings of the Bob. Everything has a heaven and hell, and it is a human responsibility. So emancipation from the nature means a form of universalistic orientation which protects the nature. On the contrary, as Abdul Baha would argue, if human beings are not emancipated from the realm of nature, act on the basis of the law of struggle for existence, that means because we have reason, because we have knowledge, because we have science, that we are going to destroy both nature and the human race, and that's what we are doing. So emancipation from the realm of nature is a precondition for realization, preservation of the sanctity of nature as well. The most systematic discussion, of, however, of the emergence of the human being as a spirit is in the writings of Baha'u'llah. There are three principles which define the emergence of human being as a spirit. First of all, as you can guess from the discussions that we have had so far, the first condition is a spiritual definition of human being. Namely, you do not reduce human beings in definition of human beings to visible sensory expression of the reality. I'm not just this body that you can see that which is different and separate and distinct from you guys and from this uh, 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 ceiling and this wall and that, that flower and the like. The truth of me is defined by something that the spirit can penetrate, namely interaction, unity, interdependence of me with all reality. That is a spiritual process which understand connections and unity ultimately. That is not the logic of senses. That is not the logic of naturalistic, everyday orientation. Baha'u'llah's writings, earliest stages of writings of Baha'u'llah are predominantly expression of this principle. His earliest writings are in the language of mysticism, hidden words, Four valleys, seven valleys, and the like, predominantly are expression of the spiritual nature of human reality. The second principle which defines is necessary for definition of human being as a human being is a historical consciousness. If we are not a natural object, if you are not an animal with particular instincts, that means that as a spirit, as consciousness, we create our environment we determine ourselves, we change, we deliberate. We have history, not nature. We have culture, not nature. 
Animals all over the world are the same. Cats, whether it is in San Francisco or in New York or in Tehran, they are all the same. They behave in very similar fashions. 200 years ago, cats behaved exactly like a, a cats behave right now. Animal, this is animals. Humans are not like that. Humans are in different places, act, think, feel, value entirely differently. And at different times, they are very, very different. Why? Because we are not just a natural entity. We have a spirit, we have consciousness. That means that we make ourselves. We change the world, and through that, we also change ourselves. We are not anything particular. We are free. We have freedom. We are a historical being. We are dynamic. We change. The opposite of this, which becomes the logic of dehumanization, reduction of human beings to the level of nature, becomes traditionalism. Traditionalism can be in the form of religious traditionalism or non-religious traditionalism. Religious traditionalism is the doctrine that God gave us the truth and laws of how to behave in the past, and for eternity that should be the same. Human being becomes an object which is passively determined by the past. No longer human beings are defined as human reality in a dynamic, active fashion, creative fashion. They are just purely determined by this external event or decree in the past. But it doesn't have to be religious. The most important theoretical expression of this issue is prominent sociologist Max Weber. Max Weber made a distinction between modernity as an expression of rationality and rationalism and traditionalism, traditional society. The most important distinction that he makes is distinction between what he calls traditional authority versus legal rational authority. In the past, we had traditional authority, meaning that laws, rules, were based upon tradition. Whatever had been in the past, whatever our forefathers have behaved, we have to act like that as well. Habits becomes a determining fact of life. Not consciousness, not deliberation, not science, but habits, what has been in the past. But Max Weber argues that this traditionalism, namely we discover laws out of tradition. We don't create the laws. We just discover them in the tradition, in the past. That is simultaneously naturalism. Namely, traditionalism means defining the rules of the behavior in terms of natural characteristics of the human beings, primarily age and sex. The social position of a person, the rights of a person, and other factors of society primarily are determined in terms of kinship relations, age, sex, and other naturalistic categories. So traditionalism becomes the dominant form of or organizing society, ultimately reduction of human beings to the realm of nature. Opposed to that becomes modernity. Modernity becomes a legal, rational authority. Law now is something which has to be enacted, legislated, created by human beings. It's not something to be found in the past. It's something that humans should deliberate, choose, and make. How we live, it has to be created by human beings rather than by finding that in the realm of material nature. So it is legal, rational authority, because it is law enacted by human being. But the basis of the life of this law becomes reason. Therefore, it becomes legal, rational authority. Through rational deliberation, we enact, we legislate the laws and rules. And on that basis, we live. For Max Weber, this is the ultimate distinction between modernity and the past. Now, in this sense, modernity becomes a supremely progressive force because it means liberation from the bondage of nature. It means creation of a society based upon reason. It means emergence of a spirit. Human beings emerge as a spirit and reason and consciousness. 
However, already in the writing of Max Weber, you see the root of the problem which plagues the materialistic modernity. Max Weber comes up with this idea that in modern times, in a rational society, laws is something that humans should create. Values are something that should be made, decided by human beings. However, there is no objective basis for making such choices. Values, from the point of view of Max Weber, are ultimately arbitrary. There is no rational basis for making the values. We have to decide our life on the basis of reason. However, values cannot be decided in a rational fashion. Therefore, ultimately, the laws that we are going to create to, to, to determine our life becomes arbitrary, becomes a chaotic world. And for that reason, Max Weber actually is the, one of the, together with Nietzsche, becomes one of the most important expressions of what later becomes postmodernism. Postmodernism emerges as a revolt against the inadequacies of rationalistic modernity. What was the problem with modernity? Modernity said that we have to have a world based upon reason. We have to make a society on the basis of reason. But the concept of reason defined in dominant discourses of the modernity is not an intersubjective reason. It's not a dialogical reason. Consciousness become an isolated island, separate from others. Consciousness is defined and reduced to the realm of body. My body is visible and separate from your bodies. My consciousness and my reason also is defined exactly in the same fashion. When Descartes says that, I think therefore I am, although his statement is extremely progressive, and it is emancipation of human beings from particularistic communities, which is a naturalistic feeling, emancipation of human beings, emergence of human beings as consciousness. But unfortunately, this consciousness has not become intersubjective, dialogical uh, phenomena. The consequence of this is that reason becomes ultimately a slave to the passions and body to our na natural characteristics. Society becomes defined as a jungle in which we are a set of consciousness fighting and competing with each other. The consequence of that ultimately becomes a world in which reason becomes only an instrument for pursuit of self-interest. Pursuit of selfish interest becomes the definition of rationality. That's the way Hobbes begins his philosophy. That's the way the philosophers of the Enlightenment predominantly see their moral concept of utilitarianism and rationalism. I'm separate from you, but I'm defined as a set of desires. Desire for money, desire for power. Reason becomes the efficient instrument for realization of this selfish interest. If reason, however, became this isolated phenomena and it becomes tied to selfish interest, then what we have is another form of reduction of human beings again to the realm of nature, and that's what happened. Colonialism, imperialism happens easily, justifiably, in this world made on the basis of reason, but the reason which is simply primarily an instrument for realization of selfish interests. A consumerist society is expression of that same concept. Destruction of the environment is another logical result of this same reduction of reason to the realm of passions and desires, to the realm of nature. Baha'u'llah has a different idea. Baha'u'llah argues that in addition to a spiritual definition of human being, which was dominant in his earlier stages of his writing, to a historical consciousness, which is the dominant theme in his second stage writings, his book of certitude and the idea that Baha'is called progressive revelation, 
is the idea of historicity, not only at the level of society, but even at the level of the word of God. Even word of God becomes dynamic and historical. But the third stage of the writings of Baha'u'llah, he emphasizes a new concept of reason. Reason becomes an intersubjective dialogical phenomenon. Baha'u'llah tells us about the signs of maturation of humanity. And what he means by that is the age of realization of reason. Guardian translated the word reason, aql, which normally is reason, intellect, as wisdom. And the reason of that is, of course, the concept of reason usually is understood as instrument for selfish desires, the concept of efficiency an issue of making means, but not having nothing to do totally arbitrary with regard to ends. For Baha'u'llah, this is not reason. Reason in truth is an intersubjective universalistic phenomenon. Reason presupposes the others. My consciousness presupposes the presence of the others. Reason is the force, is the, is the expression of spirit which recognizes interrelations of all things. Therefore, recognizes oneself in the others and discovers others within one's own reality. That's reason for Baha'u'llah. So when he talks about maturation of humanity, he says that that is the age of realization of wisdom, namely reason accompanied with moral orientation. How he defines that? He defines that in terms of the idea that he says in a number of his writings, that kingship would be left there and nobody would be interested to approach it. That's one of the signs of appearance of reason among humanity, what Baha'u'llah calls maturation of humanity. Reason, therefore, is defined for Baha'u'llah, not desire for domination, not desire for pursuit of selfish interest, not efficiency in competition and war and violence, but as desire for service. When the thirst for domination, the will to power, is replaced by the will to service with love, then you have the emergence of reason. Reason for Baha'u'llah is not efficiency in pursuit of self-interest. Reason is a spiritual power which recognizes the interconnections and unity of all beings, the spiritual reality of all beings. In another of his tablets, Baha'u'llah says, this is not translated in English, this tablet. Baha'u'llah says, for everything, there is a stage of perfection and maturation. And then he says, the perfection and maturation of reason is realized in consultation. I wish we had time to explore this idea. Consultation for Baha'u'llah means realization, maturation, perfection of reason. Reason becomes something which is dialogical. It's not subjective, it is intersubjective. And of course, social sciences now have completely shown that this is the case. How, how, do, how do I have consciousness? How do I think? I think through language. What is language? Language are the realm of a spirit, the realm of signs, of symbols. Symbols do not exist in nature. We don't think in terms of perception of things. We think in terms of symbols of reality, purely a spiritual creation. But that symbols, that words, which the Bob made it the supreme principle of presence of God, that word is intersubjective. To think presupposes the presence of others, agreement of others in terms of meaning of these symbols. To be able to think, to begin with presupposes the presence of others. And that becomes a worldview in which the birth of the human being means the birth of the idea of oneness of humanity. This is the new definition of reason and rationality. Universal peace and oneness of humanity becomes expression and realization 
of reason. Construction of a world on the basis of reason now becomes this. Not a military society. Baha'u'llah's critique of materialism of the West takes predominantly the form of the critique of militarism. He mentions this in a number of his tablets. Some of them are translated in English. Let me finish this discussion by a very brief reference to Abdul Baha's discussion of the birth of the human being. Abdul Baha gives us a new definition of freedom or liberty. To be a human being or the emergence of the human being, of course, is inseparable from the concept of freedom. Abdul Baha, however, gives us an ingenious new concept of freedom. For Abdul Baha, freedom means emancipation from the realm of nature, liberation from the bondage of nature. That means freedom. That means to become human. For that to happen, however, Abdul Baha argues that we need first to get liberated from external nature. That takes place through science and technology. Our science and technology understands the laws of nature, and through manipulating that, because of that knowledge, then defy those laws. We are right now besides this airport. We are supposed to, by nature, to walk on earth. We cannot fly, we don't have wings. But through knowledge, we discover the laws of nature, as Abdul Baha says. We create airplanes and we can fly. This is necessary for freedom, but for Abdul Baha, absolutely is not sufficient. A culture of militarism in which science becomes integrated with the art of destruction of human beings with war is a very rational process. And it means high degrees of science and liberation from nature, but that is not freedom. So for freedom to take place, it's necessary that not only we get emancipated from external nature, but emancipated from internal nature as well. How I get emancipated from internal nature? Abdul Baha's tell us. This is something that he insists on that frequently in his talks in the West and in varieties of his tablets. If you know the story of that time, the culture of that time, and the influence of Darwinism, which was interpreted in a sociological, philosophical fashion, giving rise to varieties of doctrines about society, human beings, and so on in materialistic, naturalistic form, struggle for existence became the motto of this naturalistic conception of reality. So what Abdul Baha says is that we become free not only through science, but also internally we should get liberated from the bondage of the struggle for existence. When we see ourselves and others as one organic unity interrelated and interdependent upon each other, when we discover that the basis of behavior and sentiments in society must be cooperation and love, then we are liberated from the realm of nature. I read for you one of the statements of Baha'u'llah in the tablet that he wrote to a Hague Conference. This is not a very good translation, but it gives you the basic meaning. Abdul Baha says, and among the teachings of Baha'u'llah is man's freedom, that through the ideal power spiritual power, he should be free and emancipated from the captivity of the world of nature. For as long as man is captive to nature, he is a ferocious animal, as the struggle for existence is one of the exigencies of the world of nature. This matter of the struggle for existence is the fountainhead of all calamities and is the supreme affliction. So how struggle for existence appears in human society? Because we don't have instincts, then how it appears? Abdul Baha gives another ingenious answer to this question. 
in varieties of his tablets, including the same tablet that I don't read ex his exact statement, he tells us that the way struggle for existence manifests itself, appears in human relations, is through prejudice. Prejudice, according to Abdul Baha, is the equivalent of the law of struggle for existence in the realm of nature. Prejudice means particularistic love, means exclusion of others. When I have particularistic love, but not universalistic love, the others become strangers, enemies, objects. They can be dehumanized. Violence can be justified very easily. Whether it is religious prejudice, ethnic prejudice, nationalistic prejudice, or other forms of prejudice, we have a world in which humans, the way they think, the way they, un they understand themselves, that way of thinking turns human society into a jungle. And the battle of this group against that group, this individual against that individual, this nation against that nation, and a culture of hate and militarism becomes the dominant principle of life. So to get rid of prejudices means to become human being. To get rid of prejudices means to emerge as human being. How we get rid of prejudices, Abdul Baha again frequently mentions, frequently, that prejudices can be eliminated through independent investigation of truth. This is magnificent. For the Baha'i faith, the twin principles of independent investigation of truth and oneness of humanity defines the emergence of human being as a spirit, as consciousness. At first, they might seem to be paradoxical. Independent human, independent investigation of truth means independence from others, to be different from others, to think for yourself, not to imitate others, not to follow others, to be different, to be qualitatively different, to be an individual, individuality to be emphasized, freedom to be emphasized, autonomy to be emphasized. This is independent investigation of truth. Yet, at the same time, to become a human being, what becomes necessary is discovery of our unity with others, oneness of humanity. They might appear to be opposite of each other, but that's the beauty. This paradox is the ultimate expression of truth in the Baha'i faith. To be a human being, to emerge as a spirit, requires us as a spirit to be different, to be autonomous, to think for ourselves, as Baha'u'llah says, to look at things with our own eyes, not through eyes of others, namely not through prejudice, not through particularistic identities. We look at things independently with our own eyes. Once you have had this, you can have justice. Once you had this, then you can recognize through this independent investigation of truth, through this reason, what you discover is the identity, unity of all human beings. The unity of our autonomy, individuality, at the same time, our unity with others, for Baha'u'llah, for Baha'i faith, defines the principle of a new culture, a new civilization, a culture, a civilization in which human being is going to be born a culture in which finally that human face is going to emerge out of the realm of the body. <laughs>